Okay, well, lovely to um, lovely to see everybody. Uh, <clears throat> I know we got we got um, we got. Uh, I think we got more than two continents here today. So, you know, Zendo without walls. Very very nice to be gathered like this and um, to be with folks who are devoting this time to. Uh, you know, we could call it practice, but it's really an insufficient word, practice. It's a good word because like anything we practice, we never really quite get it down. There's always further to go. <clears throat> and we, we need to keep doing it to sort of incrementally um, get closer to um, the nature of things just as they are, um, <clears throat> but, you know, it's somehow a bigger project than the word practice suggests. It's a bigger purpose where um, we're, we're really engaged in meeting. So what it is to be alive, I mean, that's, that's, and what it is for all beings to be alive and what it is for all things to exist. It's, it's a huge possibility that we humans have of being able to consciously meet that. It's, uh, it's really, uh, it, oh, it's kind of imponderable almost, except that in some ways we can we can taste what that means we can we can experience this moment in in so many different ways that get incrementally apparently clearer and more intimate uh so <clears throat> so yeah very very good to to be gathered like this of practicing friends thank you all for making the time. Uh, yesterday, we heard a fantastic talk from Valerie on the, the single stone at the bottom of the 10,000 foot deep ocean. Yes, we've got to somehow get that stone and, and do so without our hands getting wet, or really any, any of us, any, any part of us getting wet. How can that be possible? And, you know, of course, it isn't really from the perspective of our conditioned way of seeing. It's only possible when somehow we've seen through that, that has been released, we're freed from that. And so these koans like that one, they are all ways of uh, affirming our faith in, um, maybe that's not quite the right word, our confidence in having had a taste of that. You know, that, that koan uh, has, like the one from the first day that I mentioned, the uh, walking straight on a road with 99 curves, both of them come from this first collection, the miscellaneous koans that we look at once we've had some kind of decisive experience of, can we call it another dimension of our being, which is not clearly not the same as our ordinary conditioned way of seeing. It can come in various um, flavors, so to speak, but two key um, characteristics of it is that the ordinary sense of being a finite individual person, sort of caught in time, locatable in space, you know, like a, a sort of a little capsule on a grid of locality. I know where it is, it's right here and not elsewhere. And I know when it is, it's now 
on this thread that runs from the past to the future. It has memories, it has aspirations and fears, whatever, about the future. Um, that sense has gone. That's one characteristic. We are not defined, confined to one location. We are more kind of diffuse than that. And we're part of a single greater space. That's the other characteristic is a sense of not being separate. So it's not, it's sort of the, the number one, this ordinary conditioned sense of self being separate, locatable, definable, etc. That's not there. It's gone. And we are in some way, and there are different ways this can be sensed, part of what had previously seemed to be outside of us. So we call that Kensho, or Zen calls that Kensho, seeing original nature. Once that's happened, koans can help us. It's true, koans may help us toward an experience like that because they speak from it. Um, but the way of working with koans with a teacher that this lineage and others follow um, really isn't, uh, isn't operable until we've had some experience of Kensho, of awakening to original nature. Then we pick up these amazing miscellaneous koans and we somehow, we, 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 they reactivate what we've experienced in Kensho to some extent kind of thing as we work with them, with a teacher. That's, that's sort of the principle. Um, <clears throat> now, there is a great gift to the world that this system exists. And it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic that it's come down, you know, from in its current form, uh, it's really hard to say, from Hakuin, yeah, in the 18th century, he was a great Japanese master, but also from Da Wei in the 11th century in China. And in some way, you know, it does go back, I think it's kind of fair to claim all the way back to Shakyamuni Buddha and his awakening. He awakened out of the conditioned sense of things to, to what? Well, um, to something that isn't a thing, to boundlessness. Okay. Yeah. To emptiness, nothing being constructed, nothing being fabricated in some senses, uh, some terminology, <laughs> empty. That, that can mean, that term can mean different things. Um, but on the, on the base, the base level, it seems to mean no thing at all. Um, as the Heart Sutra puts it, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. Um, and um, also some sense of all, whatever there is, it's all one. So this kind of experience um, came in some way through Shakyamuni Buddha really examining uh, his experience of being alive. And we, you know, he's, he's, he's in, in Buddhism, he sort of, he can be seen as a kind of exceptional figure um, of course, and you know, even a kind of archetypal entity that can come and help and stuff like that. But also as a model, an example, it's somehow a, what's the word, is it paradigmatic figure? You know, that he's, he's a representative of something we all can aspire to doing. Maybe not to such depth and thoroughness and clarity and so on, but 
we all actually are capable of the same kind of release again but not probably as thoroughly you know but tasting something that's that is what he tasted it's not just like it it actually is it and that um, is why this zen practice and this koan practice i believe have persisted because you know they're matching something real about our makeup um, that our ordinary ways and societal ways of being conditioned don't encourage us to be aware of and it's, it's therefore quite hard to unpick the the weave of our sense of being that is conditioned it's it's not an easy matter really um and it also isn't something that can be taken head on apparently you know the more um directly we try to awaken or might do the less it'll happen it's it's that nothing stops it like like wanting it and trying to get it um, but if we diligently follow practice protocols it can happen <clears throat> now um there were questions yesterday about um mindfulness and samadhi and valerie addressed them beautifully i want to um join in and sort of chime in with some other perspectives as well. Um, but I want to do this in the context of just sort of taking a step back and reflecting on, you know, what, what we're doing, what this is all, about, what this is all, all about, really. This practice, you know, we, I quoted a little bit on the first day from this fantastic book cast by Isabel Wilkerson looking at um, America as a caste-ridden society. Now, some people object to that idea. They say, no, no, it's not, it's not, like, it's not like India where it's truly caste-based or something. But I think she makes a very persuasive argument. And it's actually, she's not the first, by any means, the first scholar to make this comment. And she tracks the lineage of scholars who've developed this, this notion that it is really a fitting lens for America, which is kind of appalling to contemplate. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, how, how good that um, uh, it's coming into the front and center of national dialogue and, and discourse right now. It's, it's appalling that it's taken so long. I mean, I suppose it had, there have been successive waves when it has. It's, you know, knowing the history is so important. And I, I mean, I, I'm a dabbler and just beginning to know it more clearly. I'm way behind having, in part, having grown up in Europe and the, len the, 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 the lens there was trained on, on the slave trade, the trade, you know, not so much the institution of slavery in the deep south of America. I mean, we knew about it. But we didn't really, you know, what, what we didn't sort of normally go into it in, in history lessons in English schools, except a little, you know. Um, but I mean, as I was saying in that first talk, it's, it's, it's staggering to think that, you know, the massacre like the Black Wall Street, Tulsa in 1921, you know, has been kind of half buried for 100 years. It's, it's its anniversary this year, round about now. And, um, you know, nobody was charged with it. 10,000 people took part in raising a whole neighborhood to the ground. And over 300 people were killed and buried in unmarked mass graves. But that, uh, according to Smithsonian Magazine, they're only now uh, locating and excavating and trying to identify everybody and i mean you know it's ironic because you know the the oklahoma city bombing uh, in which 168 people were killed has been called the you know the worst uh act of domestic terrorism in the u.s but actually this other act of domestic terrorism perpetrated not by one person but 10,000, was worse 
and and had been erased from history and um we as practitioners actually have a responsibility to be cognizant of this it's part of kind of you could regard it as an as a as an abs as an integral part of being mindful being aware of what's going on yeah we we take responsibility for the activity of the three poisons in ourselves but you know we are part of a society and we must bear witness to their activity also in society that we are part of and 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 in in whatever ways we're called to work you know to to change them to tame and temper and expose them and um we uh you know we can't do that if we're not aware of them um now buddhism actually has a pertinent history here because even in the earliest days of the sangha uh it was outside the caste system it operated as a refuge from caste in india um you know it it, it it's true that it was sort of it went into the background for quite a long time in india um uh and then re was revived i think or became more prominent in the early 20th century with ambedkar who was one of the untouchables who became a a prominent buddhist and um uh was responsible for the conversion of many many dalits or untouchables to buddhism in part because it was a way out of caste it offered an alternative vision of a society um now in line with that i want to pick up a koan today famous one from the book of equanimity um called uh it's a it's rinzai it's a famous koan actually his true person of no rank caste free person he says um he's addressing the assembly and he says um do you know that there is a true person of no rank constantly going in and coming out of the gates of your face those of you who haven't seen this true person of no rank look look the gates of the face are the senses all senses so right sort of in the midst of all our sense experience in other words really right in the midst of our experience here and now there is a true person of no rank going in coming out staying in the middle both in and out neither in nor out all the time now now and now that's his teaching if you haven't seen it look i think he means literally look it's right before your eyes it is your eyes it is your seeing it is your smelling if there may be for example a faint whiff of incense in your space for example that's it that little whiff of an aroma that's the true person of no rank your smelling of it that's the true person of no rank or you're gazing at the wall or the computer you're looking at it and your looking is it 
can you just be aware of seeing? Notice that there is an awareness. And that awareness includes seeing. Can you just sort of construct it? Can you get it that way? That's what's happening. You're seeing in or the, uh, the, the holding of seeing is an awareness. And that awareness is in the seeing and it's also of the seeing. And that very awareness is actually not confined to your body. It, it extends beyond, it includes more. And you can just kind of rest with that if you want. What's the true person of no rank? So actually that's what one of the students asks. They, they, they come up and say, excuse, sort of, excuse me, master, <laughs> what is the true person of no rank? And Rinzai being Rinzai, this is really, really great, 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 very important for us Zen is. And important in relation to what I was just saying about awareness. Rinzai is asked, what is the true person of no rank? What does he do? He sort of leaps down off his little dais, whatever it is, grabs the unfortunate person who's just asked the question, sort of shakes them and, and pushes them away and says, true person of no rank. What a shit stick you are. True person of no rank. What a shit stick you are. He's just been holding the true person of no rank. The, the poor guy or student has been sort of feeling this rough hands on him and you know, shaking him. That's the true person of no rank. What a piece of shit you are. You know, true person in the right. Why does he do that? Well, he's showing it even when he jumps down off the dais. Like, we'll, we'll go into this a bit more in a, in a moment, but he does it. Let me just say right now, because, because, because if we have some sense of what the true person in the rank is, we must not get stuck on it. You know, Henry talked about this awareness. I'm not saying that's it and only that. That would be getting attached, in Buddhist terminology, attached to a view. We, we can never do that. This, this real nature won't allow it, because it's, it's not, it doesn't have a, any kind of a stickable to form. It doesn't have that. And it's, it's a real danger or well, real risk in practice. We start to get some taste of it, have some awakening experience, maybe then another one, then another one, whatever. And we think, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. It's that incredible boundlessness. Wrong. Or, okay, oh, no, 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 it's nothing at all. That's what it is. Wrong. Or it's, uh, it's just this one beautiful flower. That was everything. That was the whole universe. That's what it is. I mean, all those things are true, but they're wrong if we think that's what we're sort of after. We're not after a thing that we can, of any kind, that we can hold on to. That's being attached to a view. He does it beautifully, just gets down off the, there it is, getting down off the dais. I've always wondered, actually, how tall are these daises that they had? You know, luckily, we don't do dais in Sambo Zen, some sort of lofty throne thing. But I wonder, like, did he kind of jump down eight feet or something, you know? Or was it really just sort of a step down? And, well, you know, just kind of wondering about the, you know, the geography of those Zen temples. Um, they're a little probably scrawny guy, you know, maybe he could, pretty light footed, he could just leap down Kung Fu style, you know, 12 feet or something unharmed suddenly he's on the poor guy piece of shit you know there it is piece of shit um okay now i'm going to wind back a bit because uh 
I want to just sort of get us to that point in a, in a gentler way. <clears throat> First of all, just about this world in flames around us, um, burning with different fires um, that are producing, you know, great, great suffering for many humans and other beings. Um, how does this practice help? You know, we, we could it'd be easy to be critical of it, you know, just sitting there doing nothing kind of thing. But actually, you know, first of all, this doesn't exclude other forms of help. It's not like, um, for very few, is it, is it, um, is it, you know, all I'm going to do is sit and my sitting is going to be my way of helping the world. And that's a rarefied, but I think actually completely valid um, approach. Uh, you know, some might not agree, but whatever, it is an approach. But, but, but stepping a little, you know, down from that lofty way, the mountaintop way kind of thing. There's, um, <clears throat> the point is that, you know, when Buddha awoke, he saw so clearly um, the engines of suffering. And because he could see them so clearly, he could also so clearly see um, the engines of well-being for all. And he summarized it in his first teaching with the four noble truths, sometimes called the four ennobling truths, you know, which are, there is suffering, it has causes, there is in fact a cessation that can happen, which is a cessation of the causes of suffering and therefore of suffering. And the way to that cessation is this path of practice. It has three main elements, the path of practice. Uh, what would we call it? Virtue or something like that, or living without harm, refraining from causing harm, number one. Number two, practicing this meditation thing. <clears throat> and thirdly, wisdom. And wisdom on probably several levels, but at least two, the first being understanding the causes of suffering, which are, which are basically the three poisons, but, but reduced to one in this, for, in this particular formulation, craving, thirsting, you know, um, there's a dire need for things to be otherwise, to have, the satiations I seek and to keep away the deprivations and frustrations that I don't want you know, and, and, and whatever represents them, whoever might be standing in my way, whatever ill will there and then first craving, but summarized just by the word craving. And so to understand that that's the origin of suffering, that's wisdom. And then we start to under, you know, see it at work in us. And oh, there it is, that little grasping, clenching, not so nice. What's it prompting me to do? What would it like me to do for it to be relieved? Well, that's um, starting to unpick the, uh, the tapestry that we, we have been caught in, you know, um, <clears throat> or the net that we've been caught in. And... Um, And by following this path of practice, uh, that can cease utterly. I mean, meaning an experience where we see clearly through, through this, this um, basically through this craving and the self that does the craving, see through them, cessation, they cease. 
we we you know it can be again sort of different levels of this but you know it's it really can be i mean in some Theravada schools they talk of cessation as being complete absence of any physicality or mentality zero experience this is rather like zen's quote-unquote death where there's just nothing there isn't really even awareness there it's really all gone and it, things reconstitute they sort of come back but but they've been seen through and attachments are broken by that um, then we really have to get careful we don't get attached to that that would be again attachment to view um, but you know that's the point if you if, if we see through suffering see through its mechanisms that clearly it becomes um, a lot easier to um, you know not be driven by our own self-based desires and needs and so on but more committed to a, a, a larger picture of concern and helping to uh, reduce suffering in the world more clearly from a very clear basis that we actually understand better you know what's going on we see the three poisons at work internally externally societally and we don't want to um we we we're, we're you know we're it's easier not to sort of step in with our own reactivity and activations of the poisons we can be more helpful so if we kind of accept that as a sort of rough sketch of the project excuse me um how do we go about it well you know one way is just sit quietly and wait yeah maybe pick up something like a koan it might fertilize the practice that's a great way to do it that's the second wheel of the two-wheeled cart where we 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 trust you know awakened nature is already here um i trust that um so nothing needs to be done really be nice if i recognize it <laughs> for myself you know if i actually see it it's not just a something i trust it's not just a sort of a an idea a proposal a proposition something i have faith in but an actual experience be very nice and it will be actually very transformative but i'm, I'm going to just trust it anyway i just sit i'm fine i don't i don't need i don't need you know to be thunder thunderstruck i'm i'm i, I trust it but it's a very beautiful way actually to sit um but arguably, you know, why not avail oneself of a bit of fertilizer, a sprinkle of, you know, miracle grow in the, in the soil of practice? Why not? It's available. Let's use it. So we take up a koan. We get some guidance. We, we sort of, um, you know, we lock on to Zazen and doing this and koan and stuff and it, it, it's it, it's great i mean it, it it may well help um that's a viable path <clears throat> because it is really transformative to go through this kind of experience but there's another way i mean there are ten thousand other ways actually ten thousand times ten thousand other ways but there's a, there's a few other very well-trodden ways. One of them is what Buddha, the Buddha himself actually seemed to teach in the Pali Canon. Uh, he recognized that some people just got it just like that. But he also recognized that that was comparatively rare and that for those of us who don't get it so easily, it's helpful to have some kind of a path of practice, meaning yes we all we all do the, the 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 those two key elements two of the three key elements of the path the restraint virtue call, what, what should we call it can we call it virtue living well living wholesomely living non-harmfully number one and number two understanding more clearly suffering and its causes well-being and its causes and trying to live in accordance with that 
committing to trying to live in accordance with others. Number two. And then the third is this practice business where he divided practice in this initial teaching into three things. Firstly, um, essentially being aware when unwholesome states of mind have arisen and um, helping them dissipate and being aware when wholesome states of mind have arisen and help nurturing them so they stick around. Basically, that was one thing. And then the second thing was mindfulness and the third thing, samadhi. So now let's, let's just, I wanna just jump in a little bit, mindfulness and samadhi. There's a, there isn't time to, to go in, you know, we could spend actually the rest of our lives talking about them and examining them and exploring them. But let's just say in Zen practice, typically, the way it works is this, you come in and you start doing mindfulness of breath counting the breath, following the breath. That's absolutely classic. Uh, the first practice of mindfulness in, in the Pali Canon is mindfulness of body. And within the body, breath is paramount. You could just do nothing but breath practice. It's great. Now, mindfulness isn't, it sort of isn't really a practice. It's a human capacity. The word sati means our, our capacity to, to be attentive and aware. And so, I mean, there's perhaps a little bit more to it, but, but when we're, what we're doing in following the breath is we're cultivating our mindfulness. We're developing our mindfulness. Now, really only doing it on breath is fine. It's okay, but it's a little bit narrow and restrictive because it's incredibly helpful to include other aspects of mindfulness, such as mindfulness of what kind of state of mind we're in, what kind of mood we're in, what, you know, is there an emotion present? Is one of the hindrances present? You know, the, it's, it's just a lot easier to practice and actually have a fruitful time if we broaden our mindfulness a bit, if we know a little bit more about it and not have quite such a stripped down version. But we're doing mindfulness with when we sit with the breath, make no mistake. That I think the reason is, why is it so stripped down in Zen? I mean, one reason is that there was this phenomenon in the 13th century in Japan, where several new forms of practice emerged, Nichiren, Dogen's, Zazen, um, Shinran's, uh, uh, Pure Land, Namu, Amida Butsu recitation. They all had something in common, which was single practice. They advocated just one practice. Dogen did that too with his Zazen, just do Zazen. Basically, that's it. But really, I mean, it's got its power and its wisdom for sure, I'm sure. But actually today, when there's just so much exploding knowledge and expertise and understanding of meditation in the West, right where we are, um, it seems to me it kind of makes sense to avail ourselves a little bit more, especially as we're culturally pretty new to meditation and can use some handholds and training wheels. And um, I, I don't really understand why we wouldn't avail ourselves of help actually if it's there. And you know, you take that to Zen monasteries in Japan, um, more recently, you just get kind of thrown into, if you could get in, I mean, I'm talking about the last few centuries, the stories seem to be like, it's hard to get in. If they let you in, they just throw you on a cushion. That's it. Zero instruction. You know, that's part of the sort of ethos of sort of breaking you down. And I don't know, just, you know, you come in, it's sort of like some, it's all a little bit like sort of karate training or kung fu training or something. Just deal with it. You're just going to sit zero help, zero guidance. You make your own way, you find your own way to peace with it. Well, again, there's probably great wisdom there, but is it so appropriate? Maybe for some, but maybe for many it's not. And it's not necessary. You know, it's just, it just seems uh, there's so much sort of wise instruction on learning to find peace in stillness on instilling our restless hearts in finding peace just little crumbs of help can go a long way and why wouldn't we avail ourselves of them that's henry's view 
So that's mindfulness. Now, as we're developing mindfulness, it is actually supposed to just in and of itself develop toward samadhi. There's, a, there's actually a sequence of seven so-called factors of awakening. One develops from the other. The first is mindfulness. Then it's uh, curiosity, investigation, getting interested in this experience of what, what's going on in me and, and you know, ha- getting to learn, get curious, getting curious about my own fabrication of suffering, you know, and, and that's great. And that leads to more energy in practice. That's the third factor. And the fourth is finding delight, joy, uh, pleasure in practice. And then beyond that, calm, finding calm in practice, and then samadhi. Samadhi meaning, uh, yeah, okay, what does it mean? Well, let let me just um, uh, speak to that a little bit. It's um, people define it in different ways. Um, But it means probably the the, the most, um, one helpful translation of it is unification a sense of wholeness that you know you're sitting somehow there's a congruence through all our experience and it's 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 um it often that comes with less effort um a kind of fulfilling sense in just being so unification is a yes a, maybe we could translate it that that term as wholeness it doesn't mean concentration in our normal sense which is often translated as it doesn't mean maintaining a steady focus on something it, it just doesn't mean that that can be part of it because doing that can lead to this sense of wholeness coming on it also doesn't mean awakening like that the whole world is one or something it doesn't mean that it just means my experience sitting here becomes whole and easy and fulfilling and it's beautiful and it has different flavors and then we're then we can look at this really interesting territory of practice that hasn't really come through very clearly in zen but maybe a little bit which is jhana practice jhanas are a set of states of samadhi really they're eight kind of levels of depth of samadhi, of clarity of samadhi. And without going into them, <clears throat> suffice to say they're often referenced in the early sutras. Buddha, the Buddha is often described as doing jhana practice. Um, I mean, they're referenced way more than mindfulness, actually. Um, and it just develops naturally. So you don't, in a way, you kind of don't, Perhaps you don't even need to hear about it, but you know it when 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 you're in it because it feels very good. It's like you don't have to do anything. Um, my teacher John, who Valerie's great friends with as well, he used to say five phases of practicing with Mu. So anybody working with Mu or another kind, bear this somehow in mind. It might help. Phase one is listening. Phase two is hearing. And the difference between those two is more like listening is sort of somehow active. We have to be generating the sound of moo. But hearing, where the hands are off the oars now, we're just hearing the moo. It's it's coming by itself. Now that's a maybe beginning flavor of samadhi when you don't have to do so much and still the momentum is carrying you. I used to sometimes get this feeling like you know years ago i i played in west indian bands in in west london and, and actually then in trinidad and for a year i mean for several years in london and, and uh parts of a year in trinidad and that included um carnival season in trinidad actually and i was a young guy and young musician and sometimes that you're playing with the band you know with this kind of wall of percussionists behind us the brass section and then bass two bass players two keyboard players four singers at the front two guitarists you know and eight percussionists behind us it would be like it would sort of lift off you know we'd be playing 
doing our lines and everybody doing their thing and you know making the music happen and you know crowd crowd is loving it whatever and then something would happen where it just gets in sync it gets in gear everybody locks on and it's really like this sort of a up 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 swelling would sort of just pick us all up we're playing as one it was a effortless thing you're doing all the things you're supposed to do the sort of tricky lines for the horns and it doesn't matter you're, you're doing it but this beat coming from behind you i don't know whether it was i suspect it came by the percussionists all they gone in sync they just started eight different instruments eight different players you know but suddenly they lock in and they're just it's just sort of one rhythm machine one rhythm machine and the whole band is then riding on this rhythm machine and and you don't have to you know you just you don't have to think at all you're just carried and you're playing the music just as it's supposed to and but no really zero effort this that's that's actually rather like samadhi i mean very different context sitting alone in silence or in a shared retreat of some kind and on it comes it just picks you up and the practice happens you know cruising you know what do you you know the co common thing when it comes on is like oh wow this is great ah i don't want to i don't want this to stop and it stops so what do we do the main thing is don't do anything you can be aware of it you can be with it and do nothing if you do that it may pick you up even more and you may start to get absorbed deeper into it and it may start to absorb deeper into you it's like getting now you're in this suspension you know this solution you're suspended in a solution there's a there's an there's a dare i call it something like an amniotic fluid and you're in it and the true you the the sweetest you the the clearest most beloved you the one who is so grateful for this life and so wants to use it wisely and as generously as possible that you is being nurtured by this amniotic fluid of samadhi you're being given a chance to grow more strongly into you the real you that you most long to be is a possibility samadhi will help that to happen and the more you steep in it the more you soak in it the deeper it can go the more refined the samadhi becomes this is what the jhana states are like they get more and more refined meaning there's less and less there till ultimately the seventh jhana is nothing nothing there um and now let's just pause to note that nothing there and yet there's an eighth jhana and when we've been in the eighth jhana, some would say, come right back down, seventh, sixth, fifth, all the way down to one. Some would say, end, come back to first, do nothing, you know, whatever. In other words, don't get attached. Rinzai, you see, I mean, he's sort of done all this, you know, so clearly, totally awakened. He's seen that everything's one. He's seen that everything's not here at all he's seen that he himself not here at all he's seen that uh that one little thought is the whole universe he's seen all these things probably many times but he's not he's not ranting and raving about great about how great it is he's free He's free. And we're somehow not free as long as we're preferring some state, some awakening, some view. It's not yet free. In a way, it's not yet Zen. Zen is so free that it doesn't even like Zen. In the end, Zen doesn't really think Zen is a good thing. 
dare I say that? It's in there. You know, it's in, it's in the tradition. You know, what's a good thing? Enjoy this persimmon or persimmon as Ryokan talked about. Shit stick. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's one of the features of person of no rank. No rank anywhere. No rank anywhere. A persimmon has its uses and its beauty, and a shit stick has its uses and its beauty. You know, well, what about if the the open heart that you know we call this retreat awakening the heart? What if the awake heart doesn't just cling to marvelous boundlessness? That that wouldn't really be awake. That would be a form of clinging. It's free of all that. It's free. What does it do when free? Well, one thing is that it, it tends to notice suffering and want to help. It doesn't want to put its head in the sand. It's, it's alive and it's awake and it has a very deep responsiveness. And um, yeah, I may get overwhelmed at times by heartbreak, but that's an occupational hazard. But it it um it wants to it wants to help. Um, it it becomes a an instrument of kanzion. I mean, that's what it would like to do anyway. Instrument of uh, merciful action or something but it's still free. No rank. Yeah, okay, um, let's see. Um, is, that, um, is that just about it for now? Um, maybe I just, just, remind us that this I mean I didn't I'm not sure I clearly said it but this this process of like mindfulness samadhi the jhana refinements of samadhi that is um that is like perhaps we could call that wheel number one I mean that is also leading to it's making much more likely the further we go the possibility of awakening to what's been here all along which isn't something um it's been here throughout but it's not something it's sort of a it it, it is it is a it is a it is also a, a wheel rut leading to same the same discovery i'm not sure i'd made that clear um <clears throat> okay, so a uh, very, very deep thanks to all of you for, for listening, for practicing, for being here, for supporting Mountain Cloud. Please support Mountain Cloud. Please support. But this is the best support, just, just coming and sitting. Okay, let's end it there, and thank you very much. <laughs>